I can get everybody's attention here. I just wanted to welcome you, first of all, from Ambient Corporation. Thank you for taking the time out today. We've got a speaker today, Rayford Smith. He's director of Smart Grid Emerging Technologies with Duke Energy. He's going to talk about the communications node strategy, cover a couple of different areas. Um, one, AMI, uh, distribution, um, street light sensing, as well as street light monitoring. And uh, then he'll talk a little bit about the distributed intelligence at the end. So uh, we'd like this to be uh, you know, interactive. So at the end, uh, please bring up some questions. And we certainly appreciate your time. And I'd like to hand it off to uh, Rayford. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, I thought what I'd talk about today is just some overview of what, we're at, what our strategy is and why we believe in the communications node as an integral part to our uh, grid modernization activities. So uh, first off, I'll talk a little bit about our test areas, so how we uh, really start to use this in our development work. Uh, and then I'll talk about the conceptual layout of what we've done and where we're headed. And uh, then I'll talk a bit about our belief in a communications node and how it plays into our, our infrastructure. And then uh, I'll talk about uh, the improvements we've been doing with it. And then uh, how we really believe that uh, one node can actually do multiple functions for us as opposed to having to build uh, siloed systems. Uh, and then of course, uh, it, it's used as a com computing platform. And we'll talk very briefly about some sample business values of what we think we can get out of it. Uh, so to start with, in Charlotte, and uh, I would uh, extend the invitation to anybody who's interested in coming, uh, we're happy to host you and show you what we've done physically in the field. But we have a test area at uh, three different substations around the metropolitan Charlotte area. At the substations themselves, we have photovoltaics, energy storage, uh, our DMS capabilities, uh, PMUs, and uh, weather station. Um, within that, we also have, uh, at McAlpine, six different circuits that also constitute part of this test area. That test area cons cons consists of about 200 line sensors, um, solar, solar photovoltaics, energy storage, uh, intelligent switches and devices, uh, once again, our DMS system, our DERM system, and AMI metering. And then last but not least, we have uh, customers that are within the McAlpine area that are also part of our test area. And they have roof-mounted solar, home energy management, uh, plug-in electric vehicles, the charging stations associated with them, smart appliances, demand response, and in-home load monitoring. This environment, though, isn't just all new test equipment. It also consists of a lot of our production systems, our production environment. We do this because when we test the new equipment, we want to understand how it integrates with our existing as-built environment. So that as we do the work on a pilot scale, we're able to scale it up and see how it might look if we were to take it for a de full deployment. Now my group does not do the deployment. Uh, actually we have other people who do do that. But we work in partnership with them to identify the business cases and the technology we want to work and deploy here for testing purposes. So I run the Emerging Technology Group for Smart Grid. And what that does is it really consists of three different distinct areas. Uh, first, the electrical grid itself. Um, so it's one thing to talk about, uh, you know, doing your, your grid, but uh, how do you really think about what are the electrical devices themselves doing? The second is the telecommunications side. How do we get messaging to and from those devices to make a smarter grid? And the third is our software and logical architecture side. In other words, it's one thing to communicate to assets and to have those assets uh, considered, but it's a whole other thing to think about the logic and the structure and the programs that will actually work in that environment and how they'll function. We can't focus on any one of these areas. We actually have to focus on all three. And so my group actually looks at all three of these areas to develop new technologies. So with that, though, we see the communications node being a central hub for a lot of what we do. So for example, the communications node, we believe that it should speak to the customer premise, assets in the premise. And that's better than using the meter as a gateway, because gosh, what happens if I have to pull the meter? then I can't talk to anything in the home and the customer has an outage. If I want to upgrade that device, I want to change that service, I'm always dealing with a meter. With a node that actually sits at the transformer in this example, that node actually is a far better solution because I can make it modular and I can replace it anytime I've got an issue. If I want to upgrade it because it's modular, I just put in the new piece that I want. Or if it's software-wise, I can remotely update it without actually having to visit an asset. That's a huge benefit over a traditional meter based uh, as a gateway. Additionally, we can talk a variety of different methodologies to assets to be able to be flexible enough to handle whatever the system, whatever our customers may throw at us. 
So for example, our communications node that we use, uh, we use PLC to talk to our smart meters. Uh, that allows us to know not just that I get the meter data, but also it tells me what phase, what connectivity between the meter and the transformer. That's huge benefits where on a mesh network I can't get that information. With this I can. I'm also, I have the ability with this, with its modular communications package, I'm also able to use 900 megahertz. So I can read herded meters if I want, or I can talk to anything else in the ISM band. But additionally, we can talk PLC to streetlights. We can use Wi-Fi as a connectivity tool to, to uh, sync up our line sensors, uh, our other intelligent distribution devices. And then for backhaul, we can use public carrier, or we can use uh, basically using an Ethernet connectivity to go back to our own fiber. Either way, you've got ultimate flexibility. What do you want to connect? Do you want it serial? We've got it. Do you want Ethernet? We've got that. Do you want PLC? We've got that. Cellular? It's great capability. It's very flexible for us. And as we need it, we can modularize it and take in or out what we want. That, to me, has huge cost benefits, not just for today, but as we think about how the network will grow and change over time. So what I've got here is a little example about how the system works today versus where we see it going and how a communication node plays an integral part of that. If we see a swing in production and the line sensor picks that up, I might route that, say, via cellular back to cell tower through the cable network and then back to the head end system where the data uh, is ultimately available to other assets in the system. Uh, well, the problem with that solution is now I've got to make my decision here and I've got to go tell the asset in the field what to do. That route, not only is it more expensive because I'm having to ship all the data through the cellular network and back around to my head end system and then into my data center, it's also extremely slow because once I've done that, I then have to make a decision and send that message back out. Instead, in the same circumstance, if I have the line sensor talk to the communications node as we do at Duke, then that information is now possible to be used on the comm node to have intelligence on the node to be able to react to that. And I can make my decision here as opposed to having to wait to make it back here in the utility office. If I make my decision here, I can update and tell the asset what to do. And additionally, I can send that information back to the head end system as I would have before and update my model. So I actually get a far faster response time as well as a more cost effective uh, response time than I had previously. If you talk to a cellular provider, they sell, if you are able to keep all your communications local to this particular circuit, and not have to backhaul it through my network. The cost to do that is significantly cheaper than if you want to route all your data through my network. What this means from a business perspective is that if I can keep everything local to the node, or at least a significant portion of it, I can actually route more data here and still be less costly than if I had routed it all the way through the system and back out like I do today. That has huge cost savings for us. One other thing we see a lot of are proprietary systems that are end-to-end -end solutions. In other words, I buy a meter, I'm stuck with the head end, I'm stuck with the proprietary method to communicate with it. I can't use data anywhere in there except for where it's out at the, at the data center. So I might have a vendor solution A, where they've got a, a carrier solution and a head end solution, and a vendor solution B, a line sensor as an example that speaks through some network back to a head end system and a solution C here, which maybe talks 900 megahertz to each other, but uh, cellular back to this head end system. Problem is the data is only available here in the data center, and to make decisions, I'm only allowed to route it here. But that shouldn't be how we do business. We should think about how to do distributed intelligence in a way that's more cost effective as well as more uh, operationally better for us. And so one way to do that is to utilize a comm node. If you route the data traffic through the comm node, then the comm node should have the ability to look at that, at that data locally and utilize it locally, improving my response time and reducing my costs. Better yet, if I can create a field message bus here, then I can route it as these nodes see various issues and basically share the decision making across the nodes to decide what to do in response to any issue that they see. So today at Duke, we're doing a variety of things and some stuff that's on the planning. First, we're managing and monitoring streetlights. This is a picture of a streetlight. It's actually right outside of our building. Here's the comm node. Basically, here's the lighting piece. We're using the comm node to uh, monitor what's happening on the street lighting network. 
we can do that. This one's a, a mesh, or excuse me, this is a mesh solution, but we also have a PLC solution that we've tested. Uh, we also do SCADA and data aggregation. We have a 100 node pilot where we're proving out the distribution automation capabilities of the node. It's the same communication device we use for lots of other things, but that device is being used to do a data aggregation and to pass data back to our SCADA system. We're doing that with reclosers, regulators, and cat banks. We're doing it via a variety of communications methodologies, some serial and some Wi-Fi. So you've got a mixture of both. Of course, this is our AMI solution that we use in Ohio. And with that, we do both gas and electric meters. So we can have the ability to do meter reads and remote connect, disconnect, and all the traditional things we think of an AMI solution. But we're also able to read the erded meters. So we don't strand those assets that previously might have been stranded from an AMR solution standpoint. We're actually able to continue to utilize them with kind of bringing their AMR solution up to an AMI light. With that, also data collection. We're doing weather stations. It's got power quality monitoring in it, so we're actually able to get power quality monitoring at the transformer, which is significantly uh, helpful for us, so we can actually use that data to figure out how the transformer's operating, how the circuit's performing. We see that data right there. We also have pa uh, partial discharge monitoring. So if you think about an underground circuit, I want to know where the fault is or if there's a fault, I can see those sorts of capabilities with this. And of course, with our line sensors, they're integrated into the solution also. Uh, distributed intelligence platform. We are partners with uh, uh, another company here to actually build out their DMS, their distributed portion of their DMS, and it will reside on our communications node. And that solution will allow us to have distributed intelligence from a DMS perspective in the field, so that as those assets encounter issues, they're actually able to make responses locally to the actual asset and the fault, as opposed to having to go back to the DMS and wait for a solution and come back. We have a pilot project we have not yet kicked off, but we're planning in 2013 to use a comm node to uh, connect to a, a remote transmission switch. So much, almost everything I've talked about has been on the distribution side, but we're also looking at how do we utilize a comm node now on the transmission side. We're also evaluating uh, doing this with a downtown underground solution. Uh, in other words, so how do we build out uh, uh, using the comm node into our a downtown solution and actually create intelligence and communications capability where we previously didn't have any. So one of the questions I get a lot when I talk about comm nodes and architectures and strategies is people don't believe that a comm node or this sort of an architecture is really capable of supporting a distributed intelligence platform. They say, you know, I've got a huge set of computers, a massive set of databases that are operating today to decide things like what is my load forecast and how should I operate my system? Well, I thought what I'd do is I'd put some context into what we're doing relative to some supercomputers to give you an idea of the computing power of this sort of a system. So to start off, one node, it's a 400 megahertz power PC processor. It's capable of 750 million instructions per second. It's got 256 megabytes of RAM. That's pretty good. Our McAlpine test area is 3,000 nodes, give or take. That's 2.3 million, million instructions per second in terms of its computing power, or 768 gigabytes of RAM. Okay, the deep blue supercomputer from IBM in 1997 that beat Gary Kasparov, it was capable of 3 million MIPS, and it had 64 gigabytes of memory, which means our McAlpine test area could probably kick its ass in chess. Okay, so that's a pretty good test area. That's a pretty impressive computing power. Our Ohio deployment will be up to 110,000 nodes, 83 million MIPS, 28.2 terabytes of, of RAM. The Watson supercomputer that played Jeopardy and won, it's 100 million MIPS or 16 terabytes of memory, which means not only could it beat somebody in chess, it can also play a hell of a game of Jeopardy. So, but if you think about that, a lot of the traditional problems that we thought about, how, how do we solve these issues? I can look at this and say, I know that we don't own a supercomputer of this magnitude at Duke today to solve these things. But in the distributed platform, I now have the ability to do some pretty impressive calculations. What I lack is the software to really take advantage of it, but that's what we're really trying to develop out is what do those capabilities, what do those tools really do? How do we really take advantage of that system in a way that we haven't traditionally been able to take advantage of it, especially when that asset is actually very close to every transformer, every asset, every issue that might occur. That's localized intelligence on a distributed platform that we really haven't seen before. 
So some sample business values. These are things that we are thinking about in terms of what kind of savings we could get from using this platform as opposed to another one. So of course, I mentioned earlier that the comm node can aggregate multiple, multiple devices. So with that device, instead of having to put a cell modem in each one, I can now use one device and aggregate multiple assets into one. That in and of itself means that at cost parity between the cell modem and the comm mode, I actually get fewer nodes, fewer assets deployed to the field, which is cheaper for us. It's lower capex. It's also lower cost as I maintain the system, fewer things to go out and fool with. Also, one other aspect about that, the diversity antenna, that's a modular antenna, which means that if I change from, say, 3G and go to LTE, I've already built in an antenna, and even if I went to some 5G capability that didn't use that, cap that range, it's a modular antenna. I pop out the old one, I put in a new one, I'm good to go. I don't have to go swap out wholesale all sorts of capabilities, right? I don't have to take down an antenna and all the coax and put up a new one. I've already got it modular into the node. Uh, better yet, this modularity allows me to do things like if I really want to deploy power quality monitoring or partial discharge monitoring in some places but not others, or I want ERT reading in some places and not others, or whatever, it's modular. I can choose to add in or take out what I need where I need it. So I can scale the system up or down wherever I may choose. It's also got built-in network management, and that sort of capability with GPS, which is already built into it, means that I've got some sense already of where things are located and how they're interconnected. And from this, we can get somewhere between a 16 to 22 percent reduction in cost on a CapEx and ongoing OM, O and M, on an original design on an IVVC. So take your original IVVC design, cell modem based, swap it instead to a comm node based thing. We're estimating on our design 16 to 22 percent reductions. And we're trying to do a pilot right now to prove out those cost reductions because it's been a spreadsheet exercise to date. But so far, we've had very positive results with it. Now, the best thing about it is that same asset can be utilized for multiple functions. We can use it for power quality monitoring at every transformer, partial discharge monitoring. Those add additional value to us. Value we might have had to install extra equipment, once again, another communications backhaul, other things that we didn't want to do necessarily. Now we've got it in one bundled asset. I've also got a multifunction platform. So once you build out those, those DA devices, let's say you just go out and do an IVVC platform. We've already touched 20 to 30 percent of your transformers that you would need to do to build out a full AMI solution. So that AMI deployment already got cheaper because you just built out a big chunk of that network already. So as you want to grow your smart grid, your grid modernization deployment, you're able to basically deploy the assets in a way that makes it most cost effective for you, to basically take off bite-sized chunks of what you're trying to accomplish. And that, last but not least, I mentioned this before, but we have the ability to do legacy erted meters, which prevents us from stranding assets like we used to before. Now we can keep that AMR solution and keep it going, and with it, it actually allows us a much better cost-effective solution than having to rip and replace things and have stranded assets. So with that, that ends uh, my talk about what we're doing, where we're planning to go. I'm very happy to hang around and answer any questions and talk about specifics. Um, and also, please, standing invitation if anybody wants to come see what we've been doing uh, in Charlotte with the Comm Nodes. And thank you very much. Okay, good. Thanks, Ray. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, good. So first of all, thank you for, for showing up and attending. And, and please, you know, this is your opportunity to talk to one of our key customers utilizing the node in the application. So spend some time with him. Come up, ask him some questions. Oh, great. Thank you again. Good. What's up, Rafe?